I want to tell you that this is going to be simple. It basically all boils down to the intracranial anatomy essentials, which is the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. And what this basically says is that the skull is a box. Only so much stuff can go in the box. And if there's too much stuff in the box, then the pressure in the box rises and herniation occurs. So I love this graphic to sort of help us understand the, the way that the brain is balanced normally. So in a normal, healthy human, there is brain in the CSF and brain in the, in the skull. There is CSF in the skull. There is also blood volume, which is both the venous component and the arterial component, which you can see if you're looking at the top of the screen. And the brain is amazing. So it can actually, it can do a lot to accommodate that purple mass. So the way that it can um, make room for that is it can shunt CSF out of, you know, in, down into the spinal column. It can also promote venous return which it does through complex mechanisms that allow a little bit more uh, venous drainage. But at some point, those, those uh, mechanisms for sort of dealing with this increased mass, you know, those are exhausted. And so that's when we get this pressure, you know, that the components are no longer able to shift around and that pressure within this fixed space is gonna start to rise. And so as we think about cerebral pathology, we're really thinking about, well, what's the extra stuff that can go in the brain. Turns out you have a lot of pathologies that go in the brain. This case is focusing on trauma, but you can also have intracerebral hemorrhage, you can have tumors, you can have edema, either from a you know, sort of subacute stroke, from an infection, from something like a demyelinating disease. You know, that too can take up mass. Or you can have additional CSF, and we term that additional CSF hydrocephalus, right? And so when we are worried about a patient presenting with trauma, with a traumatic brain injury, and we're worried about ICP, what we're really worried about is this state where the extra stuff, that purple component, is larger than what can be accommodated by the brain's normal mechanism for CSF diversion and venous volume return. And so why does it matter if the pressure starts to elevate within this fixed skull? Well, two reasons. The first is that you diminish your brain, your brain perfusion, right? And that is causing a secondary hypoxic brain injury. And if that sounds confusing, let's unpack that first. So cerebral perfusion is dependent on the mean arterial pressure of the body, the systemic pressure, minus the pressure that is resisting blood flow into the brain, which is the intracerebral pressure or the ICP. And so how much pressure the, the arteries feel to perfuse the brain is determined by the mean arterial pressure minus the ICP. So you can imagine that if the ICP rises, that cerebral perfusion pressure will fall. Now, fortunately, the brain is quite smart and it uses complex mechanisms through cerebral vascular resistant or CVR to help control the diameter of the arteries so that pressure, you know, as it varies, you know, the cerebral blood flow, what the flow of the blood that's ultimately into the brain stays the same. And so I think it's, it's a little bit easier to see that on this slide. So I want you to focus on what's in the green area there. So you'll see that bottom of this chart is, oops, let me go back. The bottom of this chart uh, or the graph shows your CPP in millimeters of mercury. And you can see in the green area, when your CPP or your MAP minus your ICP is anywhere between 50 to 150, your brain can do a pretty good job of keeping the cerebral blood flow, which is on our Y axis, constant. That's a good thing, and it does that by changing the caliber of the arteries, right? So as you need, as you have more pressure, it will narrow those arteries to provide a little resistance so you don't get too much blood flow. As you have less pressure, it will expand those arteries so that you can still get enough blood flow through that lower pressure. So again, what's really important here is that when your cerebral perfusion pressure falls below 50, you're really in the danger zone. And I've circled that in red because that's the point where you get cerebral ischemia. That is secondary injury. 
And so you can imagine that if your ICP is so high that it's causing your cerebral perfusion pressure to fall, then you can have secondary injury. You know, the brain is sort of like Goldilocks. It doesn't like things out of um, too much or too little. So you can also have kind of a bad, bad situation if you have too high of a cerebral perfusion pressure. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a different lecture when we cover press. But for now, I really want you to focus on that your cerebral perfusion pressure less than 50 is gonna cause ischemic injury secondary brain injury, which is why it's so important to keep your ICP low so that we are not causing unhappiness to the brain. All right, the second reason it matters if ICP is elevated is because herniation occurs. And again, this is coming back. I really love this diagram so much. So herniation simplified. You can no longer put more venous volume out. You can no longer put CSF into the spinal column. What happens? The brain gets out of the box, and that is not a good thing to exist for our patient. Now, herniation has a bunch of different type of uh, subtypes of specific herniation syndromes, but all of them share the final pathway that there is gonna be coma, and the coma is a result of the compression of the, and disruption of the reticular activating system, which is a really complex neurologic circuitry that exists in the brainstem. And when the brain is pushing down on the brainstem, that's disrupted and the patients go into a coma, right? So I am always so worried about our patients who have a GCS of less than eight after any sort of traumatic event, because that to me says that there is compression on the reticular activating system. 